Welcome to the Tabletop Gaming Guild Podcast. Tabletop Gaming Guild is all about the experiences and memories that playing board games with friends and families can create. On this episode, it's your host, Nathan Wilson and James Wilson. We'll be talking about local conventions, as well as whatever else we feel like talking to, because we have you listening, why not keep you? So Nathan, I heard you went to a couple conventions the last couple weeks. Sounds super cool. Can you tell me a little bit about them? So yeah, I've been to a few conventions lately for you know the local New Hampshire area. Now, Cindicon is a very small convention. There's on average about 50 people there. And it's mainly made up of the local gamers. And so there's usually isn't too much of a presence as far as designers or companies trying to sell anything. It's really just locals getting together to play games. It tends to focus a lot on the older games that people wanted to get to the table more, wanted to maybe try out with a different player count. If you're in the uh, New Hampshire area, it's a great one to go and meet people and get more involved in the community because they're always looking for extra people to join in on their games. It's held at UNH in Durham. They have a larger convention every year. Every six months, they have like their smaller version of it. Sounds like a really cool convention. It sounds like more of like a gaming focus of a convention did you have a lot of tables available did you find it like welcoming for joining in games what did you think of the overall like atmosphere while you were there oh yeah it was always a table available especially if you come first thing in the morning you can easily get on a game there tends to be a mix a lot of heavy euro games as well as a few groups trying to get into the lighter party games and things every once in a while you know after you play three four euros especially you want to get something light in there that sounds awesome what was the uh, best game you played at the convention Best game I played there, I played Evolution. Okay, is that the one where you like had the cards and you put them together to create different species of animals? Yeah, so basically you have cards of traits and you're uh, enhancing your species. And you can spend cards to actually add more species or add population to your species or add bulk. It's very important to have a bulkier herbivore so that it's a little harder for the carnivores to take you down. Do you have to pick like a track or something? It's just basically card selection. The cards are multi-purpose. The first thing you do is when you draw your cards, you have to pick one of your cards to use to go to the center, face down, and that determines the community food pool for the round. Then you go and you can either spend cards to add a new species to your pool of species or increase on your little tracker board one of the two traits you have. You just body size and population. The third option is you can actually play a card on a species to actually use the text on the card, which is a trait such as the ability to climb, which if you have that ability of climb, it prevents the predator from attacking you unless it can also climb. And that's the basis for the game. It's It scales well for however many players you want. That sounds cool. So the real question is, can you get like a bug and then a bear and then put them together? No, you can't make a bug bear. <laughs> Uh, you don't really ever define what your species is. Oh, it's just a generic species, and you're just adding traits <laughs> to it. Ah, garbage, garbage. No, okay. <laughs> so what other games did you play on there? Did you play any of the heavy Euros or anything like that? I did play Troyes. Troyes is a worker placement dice game. With dice drafting, I think? Not exactly dice drafting. So when you get dice, you actually roll your own dice and you put it in your home area. And you could use those dice to take actions. However, you can also buy other people's dice. So basically you're using your dice as worker placement, but you also have the option to steal from other people and use their workers. It is definitely a heavier Euro. Dice rolling often doesn't really go well with Euros, and I think it's kind of fell a little bit flat because of that element. A large part of the scoring is also hidden scoring. So everybody gets a card at the very beginning of the game, directing them towards a specific area that they're going to use to score. However, everybody scores that. They just don't know what it is until that's revealed at the end of the game. Or if they're paying attention, they can kind of figure it out. Sounds pretty neat. I've actually always wanted to play Taurus. It sounds like a game sort of up my alley. Anything else that you actually played there? Some light games as well. Joking Hazard. It's one of those games where like the points really don't matter, and the game really doesn't matter. It's really more about you know, just having fun and laughing, but it's flip over one card and it gives you a setup for a punchline and everybody has to pick what they want the next card to be to finish the punchline. And the moderator for that round has to figure out which one he likes the best, basically which one makes him laugh the most. 
So basically apples to apples. Yeah, basically. But a little less freeform. You actually have little cartoon drawings that setting it for you, what the joke is. Sounds interesting. I'm not very much for the social games, but sounds interesting. <laughs> the big question about Cinecon is, it, was it fun enough that you believe that you're going to go back next year? I try to go to this convention every year. It is quite a lot of fun. It's extremely cheap. It was $7 for two days, and it's, you can stay for 12 hours or more. Oh, that's really cheap. That's really good. And you actually went to a, a second convention, too, the next week, didn't you? Yes. The week after that, I went to the Granite State Gaming Summit, which is definitely one of the larger conventions in New Hampshire. Most of the people there have gone to many conventions and seem to prefer this over most of the other conventions they went to, including things like PAX Unplugged. Because at this convention, you, you have a large group of people from a relatively diverse area, mostly throughout New England. There's usually a dozen or so designers there playtesting their games, and there's usually a really good raffle where, you know, for $5 you can put in for a chance to win a $50, $100 game. That's actually really awesome. I've actually heard of the Granite State Con, so it seems like it's pretty popular. And so that definitely sounds like a gamer's con, especially with the cool playtesting thing. Did you get to playtest any games while you were there? I did try one game. It was, that is the name of my band. But it's kind of the apples to the apple thing. You have cards with words on them. The judge says a type of music he wants, and then you have to use your cards to create a band name. Oh, man, the Euro lover in me is just screaming anytime I hear like a social game like that. I'm like, no, I don't <laughs> want a human judge. Human judges are flawed. He has a lot of work to do to make up something worth being in the store. I found there was a lot of repetitiveness in the cards. You know, it has potential, but yeah, it's a part of the game. Wow. All right. <laughs> well, with that kind of game, the box cover can really sell it. I don't know. Like, a lot of those games, they don't really have a box cover. They just have, like, font. The other one just has a picture of an apple on it. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> he's actually pretty much going into a very, very saturated market, so he's going to have to do something, like, amazing to be able to even be noticed at all. Yeah, he'll have an uphill struggle for sure. Oh, we actually have a game that's like that called Stupid Duel by a local designer here in Butler called Hugh Barnes. It's sort of like a take that sort of game, but you have to narrate like how you're chaining these cards together to cause damage to your opponent. And all that's on the cards is words. There's really no pictures or anything. I don't know that anyone knows about it or it's sold outside of Butler. It's ranked, uh, it has an overall rank of 10,000, which actually is not all that bad on BGG. And uh, it's rated at 6.1, which is not bad. Overall rank of 10,000. Overall rank of 10,000. But like for the type of game it is, if you look up Stupid Duel, which is all one word, except for there's the D is shared. But if you look at the images on there, they're just words, words with values. You use them and you can build a weapon to do damage. So it's a pretty freeform open game. It is fun. I would never take it seriously, but if you're looking for like a short, fun game, it's a little silly, that would be the type of game I would recommend. The playtime's 90 minutes, Whew. but it feels like it plays very quickly, so that's always a good thing. I see it's already got two expansions, too. It does. Our local game store, which is New Dimensions Comics to Butler, uh, has the base game and both the expansions. You can pick them up there if you live locally. I can see it has a few things that are definitely going to hurt the ranking that really have nothing to do with the game itself. One, oddly spelled names, because people can't find it. I can see that. It's definitely not easy to look up yep. because of that. The other big thing is there really is no artwork. He said that he didn't put the artwork in because he didn't want you to make connections that weren't necessary. Mm -hmm. And that's why there was no artwork on it and just words. I actually worked with him for like four years. And in the four years, never remembered to bring the game in to have him sign it. That's my fault. I should see if he actually wants to come to our Butler Library game day. Yeah, then you can try out the expansions. <laughs> try out that I can actually have him sign it. <laughs> like, I've been waiting forever. I haven't actually told you, but I've been waiting forever for you to sign this. <laughs> I did actually run into another designer that I had play tested his games before. The designer of Robot Riddle? Yeah. You were telling me about that. That is a wicked hard game. 
it has an element in there where if you can tell a good story and kind of pitch what you're trying to do, you can get this bonus points to make it easier. And, you know, if you have young kids, you might want to give them more opportunities to do that and be a bit more lenient with that. The designer's name for this is Kevin Crane. And it's a great game, and I do recommend you go support it. He's a great guy, and fun to talk to is make a great game. Do you remember what the overall theme and, like, the mechanics of uh, Robot Riddle were? Oh, yeah. It'd be good if I actually told you more about the game. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Robot Riddle is a storytelling game. If you imagine above and below and... Ignore the village building part and just the dungeon delve part is kind of that idea where you're going through, you have the ongoing story, and you encounter different scenarios. You have a couple options on how you could overcome the situation, whether you want to be friendly and try to befriend this little monster that kind of pops up in front of you, or do you want to attack it? And you're using different traits that you have on your card to do that. But at any point, you can spend a little cog token and say, Oh, I use this thing that relates to my character's ability. Like, basically, how well you get into the role determines on how well you do in this game. It sounds really cool. I mean, my daughter's favorite part of Above and Below is the dungeon delving stuff. They would do that constantly just to be able to read through the books and get the different storylines and choices in there. It's definitely, like, the best part of that game, which I love. But what other games did you play at that convention? So, last week under Educational Games, we talked about a game called Wingspan. Ah, yes, you got to play Wingspan. I am super jealous of that. Well, that's not strictly true because I didn't actually get to finish the game. I'm really disappointed because we were about half hour in and it felt like about third the way through the game. And the owner of the game had to leave, so they took their copy with them, unfortunately. But that was enough I was already in. I really enjoyed this game. We talked last week how this has a lot of educational elements on the cards. It has all these details about the birds that you're talking about. Each card is unique. Each card is a different bird. And it'll have information on what they eat, uh, what type of nest they build, what their wingspan is. And the cool thing about that is that's actually tied into the game. And it's not in a way that feels gimmicky at all. You'll get little objective cards, like you'll specifically be trying to get as many birds you can that have over a certain wingspan or are named after the discoverer. I suppose I should talk about the main mechanic of the game too. It's a very satisfying engine building game. So you have three habitats that you're putting the birds into and depending on the bird will determine which habitat it can go into. And when you take an action you can either you know get a new bird out or you can activate that habitat and then if you activate that habitat that'll not only activate the function of that habitat but every bird within that habitat so you're going to have like your slots for your habitats and you're going to basically chain the birds that you put in there off of each other so that when you activate that habitat all sorts of good like synergistic things occur to you yeah exactly so there's three different habitats the top one is gathering food so as you add more birds you unlock the higher level for the habitat itself. So you might get two food instead of one, or three food even instead of one. And then each bird in the line may have a text that activates, such as you know taking an extra grub or taking an extra grain or something along that line. You got a second habitat that's all about laying eggs. So if you activate that habitat, you can get a certain amount of eggs depending on how many birds you put in there so far, and each bird will have some sort of function that's related to laying eggs. Third habitat is all about getting more birds out, and as you add more birds, you can draw more cards, and each bird down the line will have some function that relates to drawing cards. And Wingspan has three awesome things that go for it. One, it's made by my favorite publisher, Stonemeyer Games. Two, it's made by a female designer, which is with having like five daughters, I like to see female designers and board games and stuff come out more often. But the designer's name is Elizabeth Hargrave. I think this is the first game she designed. So it's really solid. And the third thing is that the little eggs look like candy. Yeah, I'd be very careful with the younger children with these eggs. Younger children, you have to be careful with the adults. <laughs> That's true. Um, but yeah, they do really look like candy. The art on this is really nice as well. It's simple, minimalist, but it works very well. I also like they have a little dice tower that comes with it that's a bird feeder style. I saw that. I actually wanted to, like, I was even thinking about getting the game just for the dice tower. <laughs> 
world's most expensive dice tower, but that dice tower looks amazing. Yeah. The production for values for this are definitely excellent, which is probably why it sells out so fast. Jamie Stegmeyer from Stonemeyer Games just put out a public apology for not having enough out there, but it really is hard to gauge like how much to do in a print run. But there's a whole new print run coming in that game, so it's going to probably be more available pretty soon. The bird cards on there, they're pretty anatomically correct, right? Yes, they are. Very realistically drawn images, as well as a lot of detail in the card itself about the bird that is actually used in the game. That sounds awesome. So that actually sounds like a pretty good like highlighted board game at that convention. Was there any other ones that you were like super stoked to play that you enjoyed? That was a really nice thing about this convention is not only did it have an excellent library, there were so many people that brought games, everything from the latest hotness to obscure games that you could normally never find. I saw a copy of Doom there. Oh. And I was so disappointed. I could not find anybody to teach me how to play that. Did you know Dune's coming back? <gasps> really? It just got announced. The original Dune Born game is getting reprinted. With the Dune theme? With the Dune theme, it's actually uh, got permission from the estate that owns the license for it. Uh, I think they did it in conjunction with the Dune movie that's getting uh, filmed. So they're redoing the Dune movie and they have like an A-list of actors for it. But I'm super excited that they're reprinting the Dune board game. Yeah, I'd absolutely love to play that. Yeah, so that's going to be one to watch out for. But back to that convention, sorry. No, that's fine. There were so many excellent games here. They had Teotihuacan. Oh, man, I so want to play that game. That game, just, I love, like, rondelles. So the whole idea of that's great. Um, I like how the board has it all the way around it, and it has, like, those pyramids central. Basically, it looks like the style of game that's me. What did you think of the game? Well, it was a game that I thought had a lot of potential. I think I might have enjoyed it a little bit more if I would got a chance to play it a second or third time. But as is... Having played through it once, I found it a little dry and a little overwhelming. There is so much information on the board itself. They put every little detail there, and it's so compressed, and it's really hard to keep track of everything. It's kind of like if you've ever played Mindira, where everything's there. It all makes perfect sense, but there's just so much, it's very easy to forget to do something. That seems like, again, reinforces my type of game. It's a heavy euro. Mm -hmm. Good. Check can be complex check there's a lot of choices and different routes you can take in the game and you have to replay it a lot to become good at it all things i like now i can see where a lot of people wouldn't like that but that's more my alley i like playing the mess out of games and getting all the nuances out and all the different play techniques and stuff that sounds like a good game for that i think i would have enjoyed it a lot more with one simple fix that being a bigger board okay it is already a big board but a slightly bigger board so the text can be a little bit bigger. Everything can be spaced a little bit more and easier to read, easier to follow. I think the iconography could need more improvement or if there's text on there, they could replace it with icons that would have worked? I think they had a good balance of text and iconography. Yeah, it's just a matter of you really had to kind of get up and look every turn just to really see what you're doing. And it really does look like it wraps around that board. So I could see where it'd be like, you're on the opposite of the table. It would be hard to see what you need to do on the other side of the table. Yep. You think if you printed out a, like a photocopy of the board? Yeah. That people could use as like a player's aid. Would that help? Maybe a breakdown of each area and what the functions of those areas w were. So you have to in front of you. Don't have to try to look on the other side of the board where you can have to go around the table to see it. Yeah, and you don't have to give up your strategy either, so you can look at that thing and not have to be like staring at a certain part of the board and everyone's like, I know you're going there, sort of thing. The nice thing about this game was the tactile nature of it. That you do have these tiles that you can buy and build onto the temple. They're basically square Mahjong tiles, and you're building a little temple collectively. One way of ending the game is by completing that temple, and I feel like that's how it's generally going to end. There is an option if a game goes beyond a certain number of turns, it will end as well. So, if let's say the price point is like 40 or $45, do you think it's worth it for that game? If you have a group that will play this on a regular basis, yes, absolutely. But this is not something you're going to go and play at your friend's house once and enjoy. No, you have to play this a couple times. Okay, so value is going to come out of playing it repeatedly. Yes, absolutely. 
That's fair. A lot of my euros I like are that way. Like Castles of Burgundy is that way. The real fun comes out of playing it multiple times. There's so many different ways you can get the points and so many different ways you can react to what people are doing. Even though you can't like directly interact with them, you can see what they're doing and adjust your strategy to try to maximize your points. So things like that sound good. I also played some rather obscure games with some other podcasters. Flip Fleur was there and played a couple games with me, and that was a lot of fun. We play a game called Cthulhu 500. Now, Cthulhu 500 is a racing-themed game, obviously, where you have these monster cars. You can roll dice to try to pass, but when you try to pass, you'll have a tentacle that reaches out and slams into the car and tries to damage the other car. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering how the Cthulhu thing would even work in that, but okay, sure. It's one of those super random games where you have all these cars and all these powers that uh, you can add to your vehicle and do damage to other cars or increase your speed to make it easier to pass or avoid damage. Or you can even have a car that starts a plague. So if you put it on an opponent's driver, at the end of his turn, it'll kill his driver. Then that plague will spread another player, and then it'll keep spreading until all the drivers are wiped out, and you never know what's going to happen. Is the plague Cthulhu or just a general plague? I believe it was the Black Plague. So this is the weirdest Cthulhu-based game I've ever heard of. Can you, like, make the uh, drivers insane and they just go in circles or something or drive the wrong way down the track or just, like, run into a wall repeatedly? No, actually, you can't. I didn't see any cards that had to do with insanity, so it's, like, a little strange for right? Cthulhu. So basically, because they had tentacles in there, they were like, well, this is weird. We just need to put something on it. Was that sort of the thing? <laughs> well, it's very lightly themed as a Cthulhu game, but... It had such a strong feel to it, more so than a lot of the other Cthulhu-themed games. Like Arkham Horror, I was like, yeah, it's so strongly Cthulhu-themed, but this felt more to the heart of Cthulhu. Craziness, the randomness, the adrenaline rush of trying to race ahead and pass up people and take them out. And I was uh, definitely more focused on damaging other players rather than going fast, and it actually worked out pretty well for me. I kept on damaging other players, and then after a while, I was like, okay. I've done enough damage. Now I can start going fast. It does sound really cool. I sort of like the theming on there. One of the games that I always wanted to play that sounds like it might be a little better, but they have the same sort of idea. Has you ever heard of Crazy Carts? Yep. Basically Mario Kart without the branding. Yeah. Now the reviews on it don't seem to be that good. I think the geek rating is like 5.6. But I guess the idea of like a Mario Kart style game, it's just, you know, you shoot shells or whatever at each other and stuff I, I couldn't imagine it getting a lot of people super excited about it it looks like there's a lot of variability in the game and it looks like it only sells on amazon for 11 dollars. so i'll probably give it a try for 11 bucks yeah i would say that's worth it i bet there's no tentacles that pop out in that game so you know, <laughs> that's a plus for that one um <laughs> But, uh, yeah, that, that whole idea of, like, a take that fun racing game that, you know, you don't take seriously, you just do and have fun, really sounds good. All right, so that was the Granite State Con. Is there anything else about that? You, it sounds awesome, so I'm assuming you're going to go to it next year. No, I really enjoyed that convention. I definitely will be going next year. I'll be going every year for sure. It's slightly more expensive than Syndicon, but still not terrible as compared to other cons. It's about 50 bucks for three days. That's, that's still really good. Yeah. So I find that very reasonable. So we have a convention yep. occurring uh, in our area uh, called SIPCon. Uh, they do that yearly. This is their spring one, and then they also have one that's called COSCON in the fall. Both of them run by an organization called Circle the Swords. So both of these conventions are more RPG based, but they also have a board game community. I've been in and talked to some people there. So I have worked with our Butler library and we have our own gaming convention that we hold every quarter. So if you're in the Butler area on April 27th, we're having it from 11 to 3.30. We also are gonna have one in July and the dates are posted at tabletopgamingguild.com slash events. But that one's more my speed. We have like 46 to 50 people there. I run a table for board games. Uh, there's a huge RPG community there. We also have another gentleman that runs like a random board game table here in uh, Butler County. Uh, there's a huge RPG community and very 
little to no board game community, and I'm trying to work to build that up. This time, I'm running Terraforming Mars with an economy management, hand drafting, engine building, awesome game. Also this time, we're going to have coffee, and the friends of the library are also going to provide food to sell because they're trying to fundraise it. Yeah, and hopefully in July, I'll be able to come down and participate. Yeah, the July one, that'd be really cool if you can come down. It's a lot of fun. It's more like a laid-back atmosphere. And did you hear there's another expansion coming out for Terraforming Mars? Yes, the expansion that's coming out called Turmoil. I believe they said they're going to take a break for a little bit after that. Terraforming Mars is supposed to have six expansions. I think that's expansion number five, so there'll be one more after that. And then Stephen Bonacore leaked that there may be a Terraforming Mars Legacy and a Terraforming Mars Deluxe version. Honestly, though, by the time the deluxe version comes out, I'm probably not going to get it because I've been uh, blinging out the game as it is. So at that time, I don't think I'm going to repurchase the game just to get the better components. Well, I've been kind of holding out for the deluxe version, so when I get it, I can show it off to you. Yeah, that's true. I'm really hoping the deluxe version actually includes all the expansions. It'd be really cool if they took the boards like the Venus track and the different colonies you get from the colony expansion and put it into one board. That would be awesome if it was a neoprene mat. Yeah, I'll be really disappointed if they don't include the expansions for the deluxe version, or at least print deluxe versions of the expansions to go with it. Yeah, I think there might be logistic problems if they did the deluxe version for the expansions, where people might accidentally buy them with the base game. Mm -hmm. So if they do that, they probably can't change the backs of the cards or do anything special in that area because they won't, won't be able to match with them and people might accidentally buy them. But who knows? We'll, we'll see. I'm also interested in seeing what Terraforming Mars Legacy would be. It doesn't make any sense to me. I love Terraforming Mars, but I'm not entirely sure that unless I do like cut the time down dramatically that I would want to play like a campaign style legacy sort of thing, like 12 mm -hmm. or 14 games back to back of it. Yeah. I don't know how they would prevent a runaway leader or anything like that. So I would, that would be one of the games that I would definitely want to see a review on before i picked it up i don't know how they would work it in as an expansion uh, the terraforming Lars legacy i don't believe is going to be expansion i mean there's no information that i know of on it so it may be but i think it's just gonna be a standalone game so i don't know we'll see i'm interested in it i love terraforming mars it could be awesome i i do think though it could be bad in a lot of ways we'll see anything else you want to talk in terms of art and motion <laughs> <laughs> well yeah that's a given so you can see that information on tabletop gaming guild slash events i'll keep that updated it'll show the latest one on there you'll have links where you can actually register for that game if you want i highly recommend that if you're in butler area during that time that you swing by and join this free open to the community event we do encourage registering for it but you don't have to registering just ensures that you'll be able to get at whatever table that we're running different games if you don't register you'll still get to play but you may not be able to get on the terraforming mars game or a side game so another thing that i'm excited about is i just got a new micro badge for bgg for the jack basswell memorial fund yeah and that's actually running right now right yeah that's running right now i put in a couple bids so i got a free micro badge it's really a good cause. You really should support it. We are not affiliated with it in any way, but it's a good charity that to support. But if Tom Vassell's listening, he can contact us at tabletopgamingguild at gmail.com. <laughs> that memorial fund is really great, and I do also say donate it to it. It's a very good cause. A lot of cool games up there, some rare things, some new hotness. Most people are very generous. I see sizable bids for things, but there's still a few things there that you can get good deals on. Yeah, you know, I encourage people to be generous. Thank you for listening to our podcast. Please like us on Facebook. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter. Join our BGG guild, guild number 2989. Or you can join our guild by going to tabletopgamingguild.com slash guild. You can also join our Slack channel where we're going to discuss board game related topics and our next podcasts. You can also visit our website, tabletopgamingguild.com, and you can email us at tabletopgamingguild at gmail.com. The Tabletop Gaming Guild podcast is a product of Tabletop Gaming Guild LLC. All rights reserved. Thanks again for listening.